I see that. Uh, so um, we're going to be talking uh, for the next 45 minutes or so about what it will take to build a world-class brokerage operation. And um, I know that it's a, a woefully short amount of time to discuss such a big and important issue, but we're going to try. We have four really, really good people up here to uh, get us thinking. So I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one. Uh, here to my immediate left is Mark McLaughlin. He's the CEO of Pacific Union Real Estate, which is uh, here in San Francisco at about 450, 500 agents. Next, we have Jennifer Warden, who's president of Baird & Werner, which uh, lays claim to the title of being the oldest real estate brokerage company in America. And she has about 1,500 agents in Chicago. Uh, and next to uh, Jennifer, we have Drew Sipp, who um, is CEO, uh, president and CEO of NRT, which is the largest uh, brokerage organization uh, in the country. And then at the very end, we have Susanna Murphy, who is uh, the CEO of Alante Real Estate, which is a small boutique brokerage out uh, in Massachusetts. So we have a really uh, nice uh, mix of perspectives here, and we talk about what it will take to build a world-class brokerage, just as like we talked earlier about what it's going to take to recruit and retain. There are tons of different answers for tons of different types of companies and markets and people. So there's no definitive answer, but we're going to get uh, some interesting takes here. So what I want to do is to, maybe I'll just start with you, Mark. So all of you have been through sort of the dark period of the past three years. You've come out of that, and you're looking forward and thinking, what's it going to take to build a superior, well-performing, profitable uh, brokerage going forward? How do you think about that over the next two, three, five years? Well. The most important thing to our company is, is the vision component. And um, we'll be four years in August since we bought Pacific Union, and we're on Vision Now 2.0. Um, the first uh, component of vision was really to, to sort of rescue and right-size the organization, which we've done. And now we're planning for the year 2017, and we have a very, very specific plan. Um, it's built around our geography and our people, and our people are really the most important part of that vision. How do we resource our staff? How do we resource our real estate professionals? What's the technology platform, the marketing platform? It's very specific. Um, and the most important part of the vision is our incredibly intense commitment to it. Um, because vision is not something that you execute only on sunny days. You have to have the confidence to execute your vision on the rainy days and on the scary days. And I think that's probably something that gives us the biggest, the single biggest competitive advantage in our marketplace. Got it. So I mean, generally speaking, you look at across competitive landscape and, and you don't see a lot of vision, even at this point? No, I, I wouldn't say that at all. I would imagine that everybody on, on the panel has tremendous vision. Right. Um, only once in four years in our management team meetings have we ever talked about a competitor. We focus on the consumer, the client, and we look at the different behaviors that the buyers and sellers are, are exploring and, and how they're behaving, and we resource our organization to that with our real estate professionals as a conduit. If we keep our eye on the competition, you know, in some places they're doing very, very well, in some places they're not. So we resource against the marketplace, the demand side of the equation rather than the supply. Got it. Jennifer, how do you look? How do you look at this going forward? Uh, I look at it going backwards first because we're a fifth generation company and so I look to the cultural uh, core values that have sustained us over time, uh, which we identify as experience, innovation, and integrity. And uh, this is a moment where the innovation piece of it is very important, but we've probably been in 10 different businesses over those generations, and it's staying true to those values that's carried us through. Um, we, we probably march to a little bit of a different drummer in this regard, because we're always reinventing ourselves. Uh, we, the, our, uh, I agree with you about commitment to vision or commitment to your strategy and your plan. Um, I think that we've had the opportunity in the past, I call it our prolonged special moment as an industry, to, to invest, uh, to, to focus, to hunker down, or as Steve Baird says, to double down. And so we've built out some a new footprint and some uh, really excellent technologies solutions to take us forward. But there, there are just a number of other um, business principles, uh, including mortgage and title, by the way, 
that are a key part of staying healthy and sustainable? Uh, so Bruce, you run a really large organization in all kinds of markets. How do you, what, what, what's the vision going forward? How do you think about taking your offices into the future? It's a great question, and like everyone else, you have to have a vision. And at NRT, our vision is to be the place to be, both in the eyes of the consumer, the eyes of the agent, and the eyes of the community. And I believe in our industry, looking into the future, it's staying focused on the basics. And the basics in our business is our people. It's a relationship business. People make the difference. If you have the right people, you will grow. And to Mark's point is that looking to an eye on the future is an eye on technology. By having the right people and having the right technology offerings and where the business is going, you will be viewed as the place to be. And I believe the company of the future, the real estate company of the future that will be successful is staying focused on the basics, but staying also focused on the future trend so you continue to ask the question, are you the place to be in the eyes of your consumer? Are you the place to be in the eyes of your agent? Are you the place to be in the eyes of your community? Your world class organization. Got it. So, Susanna, and you're, I don't want to say the odd woman out here, but you, you, are, you are the small boutique brokerage, um, a really new brand. So, you're kind of starting a new year. So, how do you, how do you intend to grow your business? You can call me the underdog in the group, that's okay. <laughs> um, I, be I believe the uh, future um, to a any brokerage, large or small, uh, from 2014 and beyond, belongs to those that look at their product as the experience. It's all about the experience. The experience that the brokers are going to provide to their agents, and the experience that those agents are going to provide to their consumers. We have amazing examples all around us. Um, Apple, um, Starbucks, Uber, who I just used for the first time in San Francisco, uh, Virgin America. Um, those are companies that are not selling their product tacos, they're not selling shoes, they are selling the experience. And I do see that lacking in real estate. Uh, we tend to talk a little bit. Um, too much about sales, um, volume, you look at it, you look at our Facebook feed, it's about how many listings we've sold, how many open houses we've done, but where is the experience that we're giving the consumer? And that's what I see the future. Got it. So what, I, what I've heard from the four of you um, are vision, innovation, integrity, vision, and, and really focusing on the basics and, and executing, and then experience. So I want to maybe ask you to, to give us a little color on those, because those are concepts, um, and without disclosing anything proprietary, of course. So just share a little bit about what that means in your organization. So Susanna, what is, ex what is your experience, your customer experience mean? Give me an example. Um, well, it appears to me that um, with technology being part of our business, uh, which has changed the way we sell real estate, obviously. We are asking of our agents to wear 25 different hats, basically. We come to all these conventions and we have vendors and we teach them how to, um, aside from the last panel, we teach them how to record their own videos, how to learn about SEO, how to do social media, and learn to open up a Facebook page. And, one hat after another one. So it's no wonder why we hear from the consumers still that there is something missing. There's a link that's missing. Uh, yesterday at one of the panels that we had, um, we heard the directly from the consumer. Uh, I think five or six were still very unhappy with the service. There is a disconnect. They don't really understand the process. Uh, they're unhappy. So I see brokerages being run as businesses truly businesses where we have a specialty departments that are supporting our fellow agents versus the agents trying to do it all and therefore allowing the agents to service their consumer becoming experts in their communities and expert negotiators. 
Okay, got it. Uh, Bruce, so, yeah, I, I agree with those lines. The industry focuses on what we even refer in our company as providing truly remarkable service. And that's important, but I think it's sort of a, it's, it's overstated. And I believe to be world class and to be able to fulfill the commitment we need to fulfill in the industry is we must not only have and provide truly remarkable service, but the service we provide must be shown and believed by our clients to have the truly remarkable skills. Uh, let's face facts. The fee that we charge, most of our clients, the brokerage fee, rivals that of an engineer, an attorney, a highly professional group of people. And to be competitive into the future and stay competitive, yes, we must provide truly remarkable service. But the service we provide must have truly remarkable skills in negotiation, being able to market properties, being able to provide those skill sets that consumers will see a point of differentiation and be able to support our value proposition. Because I think we're all, as an industry, whether or not brokers or sales associates, we're constantly trying to fend off our value proposition. And I believe that in the future, we have to continue to improve on our skill sets. And to Mark's point, that's where technology and where the industry is going. We've got to stay ahead of the curve so consumers see that we have those truly remarkable skills to be able to support the fees that we charge. Got it. So, Mark, how do you, you know, how do you think about technology as part of the vision, or how does that manifest itself within the organization? I mean, give me some, give me an example. Well, I, I think it's the fourth time I've been in Minnesota. And the first two times I was here, everybody on the stage said, if you just have a great social media campaign, you're going to be a rock star agent. And I kind of said to myself, if I had one bullet left in my gun, I'm not sure if I'm going to use it on myself or the speaker. Um, because I don't, think, um, I don't think social media is a function of technology. Social media is a function of content. And real estate professionals are paid to manage relationships, develop them into, into what we call the transaction. They are not paid with a lab in their basement with a pipe to the internet to develop newsletters and publishing materials to get up the next morning and publish it. So we got a think tank group of people together about two and a half years ago and decided we needed to be in the content business. So we hired a woman by the name of Cece Holland and she built a journalism team inside of Pacific Union to put nine stories a week out to our real estate professionals for them to distribute to their clients. The, the Bay Area does not care what Mark McLaughlin thinks about real estate. They do care about what, you know, Howard Wynn, who works in one of our offices, thinks about real estate if you're one of his 300 clients. So that's the way that we let them use technology and empower them to distribute content. And that, so that would be one example of how we drive to the future. Right, and that probably gets to, to Bruce's point about the value proposition. How do, you, how do you articulate that? How do you reinvent it? How do you continue to bolster it? I think the notion of a real estate brokerage publishing content or having a media operation within its four walls maybe a little bit challenging, but that's part of the value prop. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a huge risk. It's yeah. a, you know, for our little company, it's an investment of about $600,000 a year. Okay, but we take the approach that it's like education. The biggest risk might be not making that investment. Yeah. Got it. So that sort of ties, Jennifer, what you were saying about doubling down, right? Absolutely. Investing, like choosing your direction and yeah. leaving it, investing in it. Um, you wanted me to elaborate a little bit on, on the innovation piece. Um, we have developed, and it's interesting to be here and hear about the Black Division, and then a lot of talk about taking the back, some of the back office functions uh, out of the agents here. We've developed what we call our One Touch business system. It's, a, it's an integrated single sign-on system, uh, continually improving to really make uh, agents' lives easier on a daily basis and enable them to do more business uh, through a CRM program, et cetera. As an example, uh, and this I think speaks to a little bit to the specialization that you're talking about, we have, it, there's a, a marketing aspect to it where it's sort of fueled with an agent's listing as they sign on, it's got the photos in there already, they can do like build a bear, you know those teddy bear things, except they can build a brochure and press a button and then it gets printed through a sort of marketing services uh, setup that we've established and uh, they, can they can print it themselves, they can have it printed beautifully in the 
delivered to their office the next day, they can have it um, sent directly to their clients, the clients can print it. But what we're trying to do is position ourselves so their agents can do business anytime, anywhere, and then tying that back into how that can propel growth can change our, the way we expand from a footprint standpoint because the office needs a little different. Got it. So I want to say also, I'm, I'm walking around because I have the mic. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand. You have four of the, the smartest uh, operators in the business up here. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll make sure you get the mic. Um, so let me uh, circle back to what you said, uh, Jennifer, which was, you know, you, you created a system so that the agent can focus on what the agent does best. And that's, I think, sort of what you were getting at also, Mark. So, I want to, um, just to, to put that to use, Susanna, so how many agents do you have in your business right now? Six. Okay, so you have six agents, and as the broker, what what is the suite of services that you're providing to those agents? I mean, how do you, as a, as sort of a smaller new broker, what's the value prop if I'm an agent? It's full rate. It's, it's, it's truly run as any other corporation. Full marketing department, in-house marketing department. Uh, once um, they get hired by a seller, um, our marketing department takes that from professional photography, videography, just like Raj just uh, mentioned. Uh, brochures, online, uh, and print media. They do everything for the agent. The agents do not spend any time <coughs> tweaking pictures on realtor.com or adding description uh, online. Uh, uh, once sell the properties, uh, it goes to the closing department, um, the closing department, that they schedule, they call in on the oil bills and they can get up the HUDs and everything else aside from home inspections or obviously contractual um, paperwork. Um, and then we have a social media department. Um, I do believe they should expose themselves. I do believe uh, it's important uh, for you to create uh, exposure to your business, um, but I do think your company should be providing that for you too. I do think your company should be exposed to you, training you, and giving you full support so that our agents can be out there truly returning the phone calls and reassessing the, pro the value proposition that at one point might have given to a client and the market is shifting and it's no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the time to do that because they don't have to be in the house for three hours going from Zillow to Tulia to Craigslist, Coachless to the other 45 sites that we see the on. So, you've indicated social media is pretty important. Mark, you've had kind of a healthy skepticism about it. Um, Jennifer, how does social play into Barrett Motors' businesses? Is that part of, of the vision? I mean, what role does that play? I mean, I, I, I would sort of agree with Mark that that's been given probably a little more emphasis than it it should have been over the past few years from a brokerage perspective, but how does it play in your plans? We, I would say we have a sort of a two-pronged approach to this. Um, we are getting into the content business, I guess <laughs> the way to say that, and I think that's a given. We all need to be doing that. What we have left is, is a local business, and we're the local experts <coughs> and, and our agents know their neighborhoods, and we should be uh, leveraging that on behalf of the community, if not on behalf of agents and their clients. So there's there's a content piece, um, but sort of more down and dirty. Part of what we've done by trying to pull some of these back office functions away from the agents and actually away from the offices is we've repositioned the sort of traditional administrative person. <coughs> excuse me, who maybe was just using desktop 101 um, to make to do brochures or um, get some paperwork that we've automated or whatever, and we've upgraded their position so that they can actually help an agent on, on, on their Facebook page or on their testimonials on our, web, on sort of our agent websites or to sort of execute their um, social media plans. This is a work in process uh, because we had to get some of the paperwork out of the offices, and then we had to recalibrate a position that was entrenched. Most of them have risen to the occasion, interestingly. So we're doing it two levels, I would say locally and corporate. Okay. So Bruce, let me, uh, you know, let's say this is an audience of, you know, your office managers, right? Here it is, 2013. 
and uh, you have, you know, just a little bit of advice given that. What are, you, what are you telling them to do that they need to do for the next year? The most important thing that we tell our sales office managers, and this is true whether it be our sales office managers or someone else's sales office manager in the real estate industry, is to continually enhance the value proposition in the eyes of the sales associates. And the way you do that, and the focus needs to be on continually improving the skill set of the sales associates. I think all those that are brokers out there um, recognize that to build a successful office, whether you have one office or you have 720 offices like we do, is that the most successful office that will be in the community is that manager who's viewed in the eyes of the sales associates and being able to develop the skill sets so in the eyes of the agent they know by working in that office that they will be more productive. Uh, and that is the focus we really challenge our manager. How can they continue to build the value proposition so that they're viewed as the place to be in their real estate community? And technology, which we've been talking about, is a huge component of that. And, but I believe it's the blend of a technology offering that the eyes of the agent is going to develop lead opportunities, generate leads, be able to manage the leads, and then once the leads go to contract, having effective systems in place, transaction management system, for example, which we've heard a lot about, that they then can take the burden off the sales associate and all the mundane paperwork, put it all online, and be able to connect the agent, the broker, the vendor, and the client in a complete uh, system, which we have under home base, and then be able to attach that with an effective contact management relationship system that will then be able to cultivate that client after the transaction closes. Uh, going back to what I believe or we believe the company of the future, the successful company of the future will be, the company that gets that down right, lead generation, lead conversion, being able to manage once it goes under contract to closing, and then being able to the same system be able to do the contact relationship management, will put the broker in a better spot, will put the agent in a better spot, the client will see the value proposition, the buyer and the seller, and everyone will be in, in, in a better place to see the value proposition of what we do. So I think it's a combination of the people and building the skill set of the sales associate and offering a technology platform that would be able to build the business up. Uh, got it. So uh, I think somebody just messed with our sponsors now in focus. How do we get it back in the middle night? I have no idea. Sorry. Was it any questions? So I'm going to uh, ask you now about something that was brought up yesterday. Inman had a CEO summit, and one of the, which was focused entirely on the back office, sort of what you were talking about, Bruce. How do we take that lead, generate that lead, and then hang on to it and nurture it and convert it and keep, you know, keep it with us past the close, right? Because the people won't go away. They transact at some point in the future. And one of the things that came up was the virtual office. And I, I know that, you know, during the prolonged, what did you call it, Jennifer? The prolonged special moment, right? Of, of seven years. Seven years. <clears throat> there was so much talk about the virtual office and the cafe office and shrinking the footprint and crunching down that square foot per agent. Um, some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, it was a necessary contraction for almost everybody, but what, what's your take on the virtual office and the physical footprint? How do you look at that? Me? Yeah. Well, I was thoroughly confused yesterday. Um, I, I don't know. I'm in the people business. If I don't get the people right, the rest of it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, the, whole office, the whole discussion about the virtual office, yeah, people working from home in their bathrooms, great. Um, that, that's fine. Um, but the sense of community that we have in our culture and the sharing of information and the collaboration and the teamwork that goes on, a virtual office doesn't do that. And um, I don't know what a virtual office is. I think it means there's no office. Um, I think, I don't know, I haven't seen the virtual one just yet. No, we're different glasses. Um, but, um, so I, I, I'm sorry, I don't get it.
minute. Now, do we right size our portfolio in, in, a, in a rapid, you know, heat seeking missile like fashion? Absolutely. I think everybody, everybody in the industry did. Um, but they're not virtual. They, we still have 80,000 square feet of real estate, and it's painful on the first of every month. <laughs> uh, we have a question here, sir. Sheldon Johnston, Live Real Estate, used to be a top uh, company for a large franchise. Question for I am a virtual office, by the way, and we have an exceptional culture. So I, I, I am, and I think it's about how you manage it, how you manage your culture. But I have a question for each of you or whoever wants to answer it. We all have limitations in time and resource. Where would you direct your time towards lead generation providing value or systems and tools if you have the choice? Because you can't do it all. We have wants to answer. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think you have to do, you really have to do both, however, if you're only doing one, I think as an industry, we are much better today generating leads. Um, again, whether or not you're a one office company or you're a very large company, I think because of our internet, because of the relationship with Realtor.com or Truly or Zillow or, or all the various search engine strategies that are in place, all of us have, come, have, have been able to develop and utilize technology to create leads. The issue I believe we're facing is effectively taking those leads and converting them into real business. And in my opinion, I agree with Mark, we're in the people business. And if you focus on the skill set of your sales, of, sales associates to take those leads and incubate them and work them and develop systems, whether it be through people or through technology, that you will be a better company into the future. The good news is, is we have a better mechanism today to generate leads than the old-fashioned newspaper and some of the other things that were done that we all cringe because we knew we were spending a lot of money that wasn't necessarily making the phone ring or bringing in leads. We now have mechanisms that we can actually measure leads. That's good. But now we've got to get better at converting those leads. And in my opinion, systems are important, but think of your top quartile agents they figure out how to convert those leads. So what we've got to do as an industry, and my recommendation, is focus on those sales associates and the systems that are going to be able to convert those leads into real business. So if you can generate leads to the cows come home, and it's not going to do you any good. I, can, I'll, I agree with Bruce, and just to give you some metrics, we convert 3% of our qualified internet leads to closings. If our management team focused on growing that and tripling it, we'd be out of business. Okay, if we focus on our top quartile of people and the referral they get at the soccer field from, hey, my neighbor's thinking about selling the house, we probably can convert over 50% of those to either listings or buy side opportunities. So we're in the people business, focus on your people. Yeah, good question. Um, today's your actually your lucky day because I'm also a virtual office. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we also have a great culture. Um, I'm, a, I'm a work runner as well as a trainer. Um, certified trainers, so I train my agents, we have a great culture, we meet all the time, and quite frankly, I don't really want my agents sitting in the office, I want them out in the community doing things, meeting people, uh, networking, engaging, and I do believe it's all about the people. It's about the people as my agents, it's about the people in the community, it's about the people that are their clients, potential clients, incubating them, whatever stage they're in, it is all about the people. In terms of your back-end systems, what do you do with people, like, I used to work at Subway's, and they had a whole back-end system. You know what, I didn't use any of it. Uh, local, uh, local, larger, independent in my area, uh, William Ravis. They also have that big back-end system. Very few agents use it. We're independent contractors. We don't want all of our stuff and our systems and our every, everything in your system, because if we do happen to want to leave, and I'm not saying we ever will, but if we do, like I did leave Subway's, um, we want to make sure we have all that stuff in our system so it's an easy transition to our next. Um, so what do you do with something like that? Well, but you're managing from a place of fear. You're, you're not using the assets that, that the, the company provides because you're managing from a place of fear that they're going to steal your mailing list. And I don't know that any of us would ever do that to one of our listed professionals. I'm not managing by fear. I let my agents do what 
they're going to do. I say, go out and get your own website address. Go and use the systems you want. I can supply have all the backend systems. If you want to use them, great. Um, but why do I want to control all those systems when they're technically independent contractors and they should be able to do what they want to do with them? If I'm supplying great service and leads and training and everything else, they won't want to leave. Um, I have a quick question from Joe. <laughs> um, yes, dear. You uh, run a brokerage, virtual brokerage in Boston. Yes. If you were given a beautiful facility on Newbury Street, 3,000 square foot of living, where you could run your branding, your culture, would you still choose to be virtual? That's not a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> So I will, uh, okay, so I'll answer it this way. Yes, who wouldn't love that? But quite frankly, that's a lot of space. And I don't think I'd want that again because I want my agents out in the public doing their thing. They can be in the public while having a location. Okay, so why do I need 3,000 square feet in downtown Boston when they're all out walking around doing their appointments, things like that? Because it is about the experience that's provided to the sales agents as well as the public, the consumer. You can't do that working in your pajamas, in your... <laughs> not like you do, not like you do. Objections are between what you're going to facilitate and what's going to get down to the agent is that managing broker piece. It seems like that part hasn't transitioned well. And in most cases, the agents know the technology better than the broker. And the bro and, and because of that, the agents are not finding the broker um, a necessary piece. And it, it seems like what is, how do you go from the traditional brokers that you've had um, to the broker that can do all the licensing stuff and all that kind of stuff and, and, and license law and NAR stuff, code of ethics stuff, to the person that can help them facilitate the leads, take advantage of the home-based systems and all of that. And you're, you're absolutely right. We, we, the industry is in a transition. And I believe that as a, as a company, we have a duty to identify the new breed, if you want to use that expression, of manager that is going to be viewed in the sales associate's eyes as a resource. And I agree, the only way you can be viewed as a resource is that you can walk and talk the language that you're trying to promote. So it really gets down to a, a training situation and a development situation. Um, I spoke earlier about the skill set. I talked about the skill set of the sales associate, but there's also the skill set of the manager. This, in my opinion, the, the real estate company of the future that's going to be viewed as world class will have sales office managers that are devoted towards understanding the necessary skill sets that our sales associates need. Now, saying that, I, I will speak, and those that manage offices, I think will agree with this, is that some of your sales associates may never want to utilize the skill sets that you provide. Some will, some won't. But there is a significant population of agents, especially as we bring in the new breed of agent that we talked about earlier in some of the other sessions, is that they're looking for that direction. I know that at NRT, within our 42,000 sales associates, we have 4,000 sales associates that are identified as e-agents that are willing to do and want to do all the things that are necessary under a lead generation, lead conversion, and under a transaction management system that is a highly accountable system. That's, you know, some agents want that. Some agents do not. I agree with you, Joe. Some, some agents will never fall into that rank. 
and that's fine. As long as they're productive and provide a quality service, which I agree, you know, that's what it really comes down to. Um, I believe as the industry goes in transition, we have to stay focused on both sides, but we have to continue to build, and our managers have to have that skill set to provide that value proposition. I, I think that's a really great point, and I also think, how many managing brokers do we have in here? It's a, it is a hard job, and hats on to you, really, because you wear a lot of them. I, I uh, at least in our in our Baird and Warner world, it's it's the most important position in the company, and we are in a little bit of a transition on it. We, you know, pe we, during again the coming out of this this last seven years, we don't have as many as we had before. So some of them stuck around and spent a lot of time holding hands. Our agents are a, um, a, a segment of America and they went through foreclosures and they had families that had a lot of hardship during this period of time. So the managing broker spent really a lot of time and a lot of attention just helping people get through and help their clients get through what our industry's been and our economy's been, been got through. I feel like our managers are sort of settling back in and some of them are saying I'm, I'm grabbing onto this new stuff and I'm up for you know, getting back onto this magic carpet and going to the next level, and some of them will probably, you know, say, I'm, you know, my investments went down for a period of time, and now I'm back where I want to be. So a big focus for us, actually, is getting that pipeline going again uh, with management development, et cetera. Will the position change uh, materially, and could we specialize so there was more transaction management, um, on one piece, one uh, more sort of technology expertise, more real estate sales. Possibly, I think it depends on a little bit on the size of the office as well. Uh, but you know, again, thank you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing job. Okay. So we had uh, one more question back here. This. It's really more of a statement. Um, I'm Teresa Ryan, I'm the broker owner of Ryan Hill Realty, which is a boutique real estate company in Naperville, Illinois. My company is about 12 years old and I've gone through all the transitions that everyone has. Uh, an area back to the lead generation and conversion, that's an area that caught my attention about five years ago when I started tracking the conversion rates of my agents. And, um, you know, how most brokerages, you get a lead and you give it to the next agent. But well, what I found is that our conversion was less than 0.5%. And I think that's, if, if anyone tracks your conversion to your leads, I think you'll be um, very sad to see that your results are probably about the same. So what I saw is Karen spending all this money to, to uh, market and brand our company, to market our listings, uh, to market our agents, to just be all over. And, and if any of, your, if any of your, our owners, you know what you spend, to build the brand of your company and, and to attract agents and attract buyers and sellers. So I'm going, okay, well here we're spending all this money to bring in buyers and sellers and then we're giving them, giving them to these agents, you know, and it's on the round robin method where, you know, maybe that maybe that agent's you know, with a buyer and they're gonna be out for four hours and they're not gonna return the call. The key statistics show that you need to call back within 10 minutes or less, or that buyer or seller has gone on to someone else. They're, they're very instant, and they, they want instant, you know, instant gratification. So what we did is we implemented an inside sales division. So all the buyer and seller lead calls that are generated by the resources of the company go to my inside sales division. And uh, sometimes those calls still go to voicemail. I'm implementing a system and getting more staff to where the goal is for those calls never go to a voicemail, to always go to a person and get answered. Pardon? Oh, well anyway, I'm just, we're out of time. <laughs> Our, the, transit, the, the conversion is much higher and we're matching those buyers and sellers with agents that are suited to take care of them. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, we are pretty much out of time. And as I said at the beginning, it, it's really kind of a shame to talk about something so important and so broad in 45 minutes. It's tough. But I, I would say, as I sort of distill what I've heard here, is that 
really, you know, we come to this event and it's like a technology buffet and we put a bunch of stuff on our plate and then we don't feel so good after. <laughs> so that's kind of what this is about. And what often happens from a broker perspective is you consume all this stuff, but it doesn't really amount to what we would call a strategy and certainly not a vision. So I've heard, and these are soft concepts, right? but they're very real, is that vision, innovation, experience, and uh, people uh, are really where it's at. And, and that's extremely hard to articulate on a panel that's 45 minutes long, but knowing many brokers, some of them are in this audience, it's absolutely the truth. So um, I guess that's the takeaway, and I want to thank- Can a little asterisk on the people piece? Sure. Which is the offices and the companies are going to need to have more diverse people uh -huh. to reflect yep. our country. Okay. So that um, remains strong. Okay. So thank you, Mark, Jennifer, Bruce, and Susanna very much.